quarter. I'd say the quarters are no, I'm talking about them there are fuse boxes today. You don't know what we're doing. And, and, um, there's a there's a pretty good bit of understanding required uh, before you come to fuse boxes. Basically what I'm gonna and this is gonna uh, wobble into some parasitic green stuff and that kind of thing. And so we're gonna start out here. Now what happens when you don't have fuses on a circuit? That's why you call people during class or it's not very nice. So you basically, what you do is you burn up wires, you got to put a circuit, weak link in a circuit that will open a stop current flow in case you got a short circuit, what you got there. Okay, so basically fusible links are basically a hypalon, chlorofluorinated polyethylene radio, 150 degrees Celsius, continuous, op continuous operating temperature. So they're made to run, work real hot. That particular insulation is supposed to contain so what happens if you've got that wire that burns through on the inside of it so that it doesn't start fires and stuff? And it, was, it came out of, uh, you know, the design for that was kind of like a slow blow fuse. And you will see occasionally, even on the newer model cars, a fusible link. And the insulation is sort of soft and rubbery. And the way that you check it to see if it's burned in two on the inside is you stretch the fuse link and if it stretches it means that it doesn't have any wires go good in there and we used to do it all the time now they i've got some fusible link wires that they uh that i bought uh the, what i didn't like about it the fusible links that come on the car is a different kind of wire than just copper you know it's some kind of silver wire and i don't know what kind of wire that is and you can even do research on that what kind of the wire what kind of wire is in a fuse link uh, but it's you can't really find it anywhere, and that's one of the things that, that bugs me a little bit. Because I've always said that that silver wire I think is a, is a better grade stuff than the copper, one way or another. Um, now you got easily easily replaceable glass fuses. This fuse box is led, it's fed by fusible link. So when you see this fuse box right here, typically there's fusible links going to a little junction post under the hood, and it's basically feeding it here. Sometimes. On these fuse panels, on Chevrolets and stuff, you'll basically have a bunch of wires connected where it goes through the firewall with a bunch of gummy tar looking dielectric grease on them to keep them from getting corroded and all. But this is actually the fuse panel under the dash of a 73 Impala, is what that is. And, um, and those cars were brand new nearly when I graduated from high school. Uh, now, this right here is what it looked like under the hood, if you open the hood of a Volkswagen, you're looking at the spare tire. I'm talking about a Volkswagen bug, the old one. You're looking at the spare tire and the stuff under there. And that little dab of wire that you see right there was pretty much all there was behind the dash on a Volkswagen bug. But you kind of had to know what was going on. Uh, but my dad worked on it without a schematic or anything. Uh, now, the fuses were odd looking little things. They were little plastic deals that were pointy on each end, and they had a a little piece of uh, mica that was supposed to burn into uh, whenever they did that. That's basically what that looked like. You know, this is a later model car, but the fuses look like those right there. And see, so you get a closer up view of them right there when I did that. And it's a strange looking little, the way German folks did the fuses on their car. You see that little piece of mica right there? All right. Now, this is a little personal trivia here. Uh, the first car I legally drove was a Corvair Spider. That's what I had. It was a cool little car. Uh, had a little horizontal opposed air-cooled six-cylinder in the back of it and who knows what one peculiar thing if you've ever heard of anybody talk about a Corvair the motor turns backwards when you're standing there looking at the motor it turns the opposite direction and you could they, you could you could literally take one of these air-cooled V6s I mean straight sixes horizontal opposed air-cooled and you could if you cut the fenders and off off the back of a Volkswagen bug, you could stuff one in there and make it work. It would bolt up and everything. But you'd have four reverse gears and one forward. <laughs> so you have to take the transaxle apart and put the ring gear on the other side of the pinion, and then you'd have four forward gears. My dad, somebody asked him one day, whatever, and they says, uh, they says, don't you work on Corvairs? He says, yeah, but I always have to do it with the doors closed. And he says, why do you have to close the doors? He goes, because if they see me working on one, they'll bring me another one. And he really didn't like those. Much. My mother drove one for a while. But I drove that one right there. And this one right here, the first vehicle I ever actually drove, you know, that I could call my vehicle was a 55 Chevy pickup. And there I am getting into it right there. That was in the summer of 71. And then in 72, I had built this buggy here. You know, me and my brother would ride it there. 
And this is a car I was driving in the summer of 74 when I was in, you know, between years of high school. And I had lots of hair back then, too, but one way or another. Okay, back to the lesson. 79 Trans Am fuse panel. 80 model Trans Am fuse panel. You see the difference there. Pontiac Trans Am, both cars, both of fuse panels. See the glass fuses in the 79? See the ones in the 80s? Now, Little Fuse introduced a groundbreaking auto fuse, fast acting fuse for General Motors, which was ease, but it didn't show up on GM cars until about 1980 when computers also appeared on some of the models and all that. General Motors called their computer system Computer Command Control, basically what they call it. And in 1981, I went to school on that in Houston, Texas. All right. Now then, under hood fuse panels came even later. Now, most of the cars in those olden days did not have under hood fuse panels. They just had the one under the dash, and that's all they had, because the wiring was really complicated anyway. Okay, so basically what you're seeing here, uh, you're seeing a whole bunch of fusible links. This is the starter relay on the fender of those Fords, but on the, on the GM, one of the things they used for a junction post on the GM was the big post on the starter itself. On the Ford, the starter relay was up on the fender in those days, and they, like on the Bronco, and they would basically have all of those fuse links stacked on their feed and various different things, and that's what they looked like. You may have seen that before. See all the things that are fusible links on that? Uh, some later model vehicles still use fusible links on them. All right. Then you came to the underhood fuse panel, and we got some more fuses in the underhood panel, big ones, some diodes, some relays, and other things they were stuffing out there. Anybody seen a fuse panel that looked like that before? What is it? What's that in? You seen one like that? Anybody know? You got any idea where this car might have been built? This is actually an Asian car. It was a Honda. And the fact is, some of these screws are put in here. I mean, some of these fuses are put in here with screws. Now, these screws you can see. And some of them, now listen to me really carefully on this. Some of them, they'll have like an 80 amp fuse. It looks like you ought to be able to unplug it. But it is down in there with uh, screws. It's got fork terminals going down in there. And you've got to pop some little covers out of the way and take screws loose on each side before you can bring that fuse out of there. Don't grab an 80 or 100 amp fuse with a pair of pliers and try to jerk it out of there. Because it ain't going to come and you'll just bust it and look like an idiot. You know what I mean? If, you've got, if you see an 80 or 100 amp fuse, they're not going to depend on blade terminals. They're just sliding down to it. They're going to have screw terminals on it. Kind of like which of the only right here. All right. Sometimes there's two instrument panel fuse panels. Uh, one of the trainer vehicles we got out here has got two fuse panels under the dash. It's got one on the right and it's got one on the left. And the one on the right's got the fuel pump fuse and relay in it. The one on the left has got a bunch of other fuses. Of course, there's other fuses in the one on the right too. But you'll see right hand instrument panel fuse panel and left hand instrument panel fuse panel. And that, huh? Now the old mobile. All right. The number of active loads increases. This is Jonathan down here. The alternator has to man up and handle those loads, but there's a price to pay if the drag placed on the serpentine belt increases as the alternator works harder. You seen a fuse like that before? I showed somebody one the other day in my office, didn't I? Yeah. All right. You expect to see a lot more of these because what they're trying to do is they're trying to make the cars lighter and they're trying to make it where they could put more fuse in there. When I wired up my house in 1986, I basically put those little teeter breakers where you can put two breakers, one, one breaker went, so I could have lots of breakers. I mean, I didn't want to put a whole lot of stuff on any one breaker. I was kind of concerned about that. But anyway, uh, they provide power to two circuits. This one here provides the power. These are the two circuits that are fed. It is possible to blow just half of this fuse. So if you're checking it on top and you see you got power here, but you don't have power here, but you do have power there, you still got to replace the fuse. And it's a kind of a waste, you know, because you got one side of it that's still good. Uh, that's what they do. There's several different varieties of this. And they got little small, various different little kinds of oddball fuses that they're making nowadays. But the aggravating part of that. So the smart junction box came along. Another place to stuff a computer. Let's stuff a computer somewhere else. We're going to put one in the fuse panel. Okay? The Ford Smart Junction Box was designed by Ford and Lear. And the Smart Junction Box is a hub in the electrical system. It includes power windows, door locks, all the lighting, the instrumentation, even the entertainment system, which for years was a standalone system. Smart Junction Box technology has fuses, relays, microcontroller, multiple layers of interconnection, 
into an integrated assembly. It's designed to provide circuit protection by shutting down loads that are drawing excessive current. Not only does it blow a fuse, but it actually can shut down load. Now there are Chrysler, and I'm sure some of these other fuse panels too. You might even see in some of these Chrysler fuse panels, there's little things that look like little small disc capacitors in there, but that's not what they are. Those things will actually interrupt a circuit if there's a short. When I was at Chrysler school over there, I went to an electrical school at Chrysler because you know Chrysler bought Jeep and we all had to, you know, I had to go back to electrical school and get certified on that. But he actually had a bunch of those little things in a uh, box, and he gave each one of us one so that we could make a, a, a fuse jumper. Hey, yeah, your fuse. Uh, right uh, so you got all this stuff right here, all these little mini fuses that can blow, but you've also got a little disc thing that shuts off the, uh, the power. And I've got one of those jumper wires I built at home in my toolbox, I'll bring it up here. You can create a short there, and all of a sudden it'll get to where it won't conduct anymore, but if you let it cool off, it starts conducting again. Pretty cool, it's like a fuse that replaces itself. All right, now then, uh, on some of those F-150s, you might notice there was, uh, sometimes if there's a little water leak at the base of the windshield, it'll wet that fuse panel. It's a laminated thing, and it will wind up causing all kinds of crazy electrical problems. And if you've got all kinds of crazy electrical problems, it can be a coil on plug coil that's bad, creating a lot of electrical interference. It makes those, you know, I mean, the dash go crazy and it's all kinds of stuff. It can make it run really lousy. Uh, Jimmy had an expedition over there one day that was sputtering and popping and cutting up and going crazy and all that stuff. And uh, we were looking at it together and we were wondering if it had, uh, you know, alcohol in the gas and we checked all that and everything. But it turned out he went through there unplugging the coils one at a time until he found the one that he unplugged. And it wouldn't show up on the scan tool and it wouldn't show up any other way. He had to basically just kill the, the coils one at a time until he found the one. See, it wasn't misfiring on that cylinder. But it was creating electrical interference or F5. I got the wrong one. Of course, somewhere I got to find you here talking in the radio. Yeah. yeah so that's just a, a small manifestation of it. But look at these words right here. Scrap if dropped. I got one of those over there somewhere that I didn't want to dig out. If you drop it, you bought it. Also, it is possible if you hit a bump hard enough, you can damage one of these. Wham! You know, like you hit a, ho a pothole really hard and if there's enough of the shock that goes up through there, uh, that is a nasty business. Now over here is where your fuses are. But this whole thing has got that. Now what was a sort of a precursor to this? You remember the 97 Sable we got out there? Had a gym module piggybacked on the back of it. And whenever uh, we were uh, uh, back in years ago when Eddie was in uh, overseas the Coast Guard, his wife went to a local filling station and they hooked, or 98 Taurus and they hooked the battery up backwards. And when they did, she lost her variable assist power steering, her gas gauge went crazy, and uh, something else I forgot. And so we had to put a gas gauge and a slosh module on it, and we had to put a gym module on it, because the gym module on that one, as I remember, operated the variable assist power steering. Gym module is generic electronic module. And they piggybacked that thing usually on the uh, fuse box. Sometimes it was a standalone in the early days. But that was the precursor to this smart junction box. They started just cramming it all in there. All right. So uh, also, they, most of these fuse panels have an internal processor and are part of one or more of the information buses. Look at this. On the 2006 Hyundai, we got, we got something right out here. Looks like this is no problem. If I discover one of these door lock relays is bad, I'll just put a relay in it, right? <coughs> well, that's wrong. It looks like a box. Made together, man. You can't get those relays out there. Some of the Toyotas are like that, too. The fuel pump relay is built into a box like that. And um, I've showed this before. This right here has uh, come off at Chrysler Crossfire. It's a $400 box. It's got a bunch of relays built into it. And you can't change the relay separately. Now, you can pop the cover off of it and tell, see the relays all soldered onto the board. You know, but there's always been, they've always been toying around with putting relays together. A little escort has got a, a little, uh, what do they call that, control, uh, anyway, it's an integrated relay control module and it's got five relays in it. It's got a fuel pump relay, power relay, low and high fan relay, and it's got an AC relay in it. They're all made together in that one box. 
So they've been horsing around with it for a long time. But on this particular one, if I wanted to fix the door locks on the Sonata, what I would have to do would be buy a $750 fuse panel. Because these relays right here, if you don't use the door locks, these relays, their little contacts get oxidized and they get to where they won't work. Can you take con uh, contact cleaner to them? You can't get to them. Can get to them? They're no, buried in a plastic box like that one up there. Can you take the box off? Well, you probably could, but you might be surprised what's in there. It's a bunch of doggone laminated pieces of plastic with stems pulling up through there. And you, you, I mean, uh, it doesn't take long. I tore one of those other ones apart one day just to see what was going on with it. Uh, can I fix this? Because in your mind, you're feeling like it's stuff soldered. Uh-uh. No, it's got layers of plastic and copper interleaved in there with, and various different tabs bent up. And I mean, it's, you'd, you'd be amazed what's in there and how aggravating it'd be to try to get in there and fix it as much as you wanted to try. You know, you might be getting it over your head real fast. And then you'd be in worse shape than what you were. Now, some of the problems with spark junction boxes on these forge can be addressed by reflashing. Uh, I told that story at one time about that uh, 89, I mean, 99 Mustang that uh, I was trying to get the fob to work. And they said, the fob don't work. And so I mashed the button on the fob and didn't get anything. So I said, well, maybe it needs to be reprogrammed. So I turned the key on five or six times, whatever it was, five times or eight times, depending on what the model it was. And it went, whoop, whoop. And I mashed the button and it went, whoop, whoop. And I turned it off and it went, whoop, whoop. And I said, well, okay, I don't know this fob. Still wouldn't work. And so I'm looking around and I reflashed the uh, little gem module and all that stuff. And then I call over to the hotline and the guy said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember this. We had to do this one time before. And he says, and I don't remember the exact fuse number, but he says, pull fuse number 26 and leave it out of there for about 10 seconds and put it back in and that will be okay. <laughs> so I pull fuse 26, left it out of there, plugged it back in, the door locked. How are you supposed to know that? You know what I'm All right, but anyway, the shock sensitive design, you know, is, you know, they have a tendency to get damaged whenever you get it. I don't know what damage is, but anyway. Now, reprogramming usually takes a Ford IDS scan tool. Now, some of the common concerns, watch this, you all will see this. I've seen this right out here. One or more brake lines is stuck on all the time. Battery drains, when I say one or more brake lights, I mean on a Mustang, it will be one of the segments of the three because they're all wired coming from that box. Why would they wire each segment of that light with a different wire coming from that box? Otherwise, it all comes at the same time. So, well, so they can... Either that or a bone blue. That's what I'm saying. You got to do, do, do. Yeah. I mean, if it was all wired, one wired, it all come on at the same time. Yeah, that's right. But just now, the, the 06 model that I found this happening on didn't have that sequential, but it was still coming with separate wire. But anyway, and I told her, I said, it's going to be about $400 if you want to. She said, well, I guess I'll have to save that money for that. And I said, no, that one light, but you don't need that one light. I just took your bowl back because it was on all the time, killing the battery. But just leave it out. Now, we could. Just tap into it, and, <laughs> you know, with a wire, but we didn't do that. All right, battery drains quickly when a car sits for a few days. Headlights on bright all the time. Turn signals or park lights are stuck. Power windows don't work. Instrument cluster malfunctions. Dash lights quit working. That's the kind of stuff you'll run into. It may make you have to have a smart junction lock. Now then, this is a Nissan Intelligent Power Distribution Module. This is the same thing except it's on a Nissan. Watch this thing. Don't look at your phone. The IPDM works on the same basic principles as the Ford SJB. Be writing these notes down because I'm looking for them whenever I take your note pages up. All right. The only serviceable parts of the unit are the fuses. Does it look to you like you ought to be able to change those relays? Yeah. You can't. That requires a special tool. Don't try to remove any of the other relays even though it looks like you can. Check the shop manual and always use the Denafix to check the SBs. If a reflash won't fix it, replace it. That's how that works. Now, there is a special tool you can use to get the uh, engine control relay out if you have to have one of those. And those things like to crap out at least. Symptoms of a faulty ECM relay in the IVTM. Uh, any or all of these may happen randomly, but eventually the nose start becomes prevalent. Sputtering and loss of power, warning lights, flashing illuminated mail, but without codes, start and stall, no start, stalls while driving. Now, why would a bad ECM relay? Cause it to do any of this stuff without throwing a code. Where are the codes stored in the ECM, in the PCM? If the PCM goes to sleep or is shut down or is turned off, can it store codes? No, it cannot. All right. Chrysler's totally integrated power module. 
And you'll see one of these sooner or later. That's what it looks like right there. Uh, you got recent Chrysler Kipham recalls. No start first time. No start ever. Start and stall. Fuel pumps that run all the time. Stalling. Always look at Identifix or TSDs and working on these. See if you see that. There was one truck uh, back in the 90s, late 90s, that uh, the fix for some problem, I don't remember what it was, was to take the wires loose that were going to it from the network and put more twists in them. It didn't have enough twists in the wires. And those networks are really spooky because you've got to have a certain number of twists per inch for them to work right <coughs> to prevent interference from getting in there and, and, and screwing them up. All right, diagnostic uh, strategy. Uh, IETN or Identifix are crucial tools. Know how to use a multimeter. In other words, whenever somebody gets ready to measure volts and I see them putting it on ohms, it really bothers me. Right? Know how to use a scope. Understand how to diagnose normal electrical faults. Know how to use a really good scan tool. Know how to read schematics. Don't try to guess your way to a fix on any late model vehicle. That's you, Jonathan. Don't get really familiar with power and ground distribution schematics. Excuse me. I didn't say don't. I meant to say get. Get, get really familiar with it. Get, look for common grounds and common power. That's the point. We, we talked about that a little bit last week. All right. Before you start a parasitic draw test, now this is important too. Close the doors and lock them with the key fob. Because when you lock them with a key fob, you're doing something different than when you just close the doors and lock them with a button on the inside. All right. If the hood's open, make sure you close the latch with a screwdriver, but make sure you open the latch with a screwdriver before you close the hood, because it's going to bounce right back up if you don't. All right. Move the keys at least 10 feet away from the car, because on some of them, when it sees that smart key fob, it turns circuit zone that will kill your battery or make you, you know, mess you up on a parasitic draw test. Make sure any Bluetooth device, such as a smartphone or Bluetooth headset, removed from the vehicle. If that stuff's laying in the vehicle, it may be connected to the car and it may be keeping stuff awake. Wait a few minutes for the remaining modules to go to sleep. Don't waste time playing eight ball pool or any such nonsense on your phone <laughs> while you're waiting. Use your time wisely. Go to work making money on another vehicle during this time and return when that job is done. Somebody that's smart, somebody that's making money, that's working at a place where work is being done, when they're on their way to the parts room, they'll be walking like they're late for an appointment. I was talking about that years ago in here, I mean, back in the early 2000s. And uh, a guy I got working over at this place at Enterprise, he says, every week I see guys standing around at the water fountain or the coffee table, playing on their phone, shooting the bull, and at the end of the week, those are the guys that are crying because they ain't got no money. He says, I'm working the whole time. I don't ever stop working. He said, but they're, I mean, he said, exactly what you told us about is what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, common mistakes and oversights. Having the Toyota smart key in or near the car will wake up the modules associated with the entry system and in many cases will turn on the lighting. That's going to confuse you if you're doing a parasitic draw test. That's why Toyota says make sure the smart key is at least 10 feet from the vehicle when searching for parasitic grains. And you remember the Bluetooth connected devices connect to the hands free link. On a Honda, the Bluetooth may have, and then you have communication with the module, so get your smartphones and all that junk out of the vehicle, and that will eliminate the possibility of these modules keeping a module awake. When it's not good to pull fuses without knowing what they feed. Remember how modules that have been allowed to go to sleep, you know, you walked off for an hour or so and you let them go to sleep, and if you walk up there and the first fuse you pull is feeding one of those modules that has to recharge, and you're going you're, you're gonna to wait in game again. You know, you're going to do the play eight ball pool on my phone thing again, all this kind of junk. All right, so basically what we want to do is we want to look at our wiring schematic and we're going to say, fuse is this one, this one, and this one feed modules. I'm not going to pull them right now. I'm just going to pull the other ones. And also, don't forget to unhook the big post on the alternator too because sometimes they'll be your draw. You know, yeah. uh, so you don't want to, you know, take a break. You have to take a break and lose time if you pull the wrong fuse in it. Michael has to wake back up. Now here's something pretty cool. You can measure a voltage drop across fuses to find a parasitic drain. That's really neat because you ain't got to pull the fuses out. Now you can't do that on some of the circuit breakers and fuses like this one at all, but you can on those. All right. You can, and where there's connections, there's always some resistance and where current's flowing, anywhere there's a little bit of resistance, you're going to read some voltage drop, but you're going to put your meter on a really low scale, like two volts, you know, which would be 2,000 millivolts. 
And sometimes you can find the drain really, really quick that way by just checking those. But you need to actually get a sort of a reading in your own mind, check a bunch of them, make a draw on a fuse that you know feeds something, and measure it just to see what you're used to looking like. That's right? what you're used to seeing. Remember the amount of voltage drops really little when you're doing the measurement, so you'll be measuring in millivolts rather than in volts. It will just be a tiny little bit of whisper of current. All right, and there's your settings. That's what settings you're going to use right there. Way down here, not 20 volts, not 200. You're going to go on a DC volt side, and you're going to be 20 millivolts or 2,000 millivolts. It's going to be two volts here. Okay, a measurement under 30 millivolts is not a problem, and the amount of voltage drop may vary depending on the type of fuse in that position. Now, eliminate all your non-module feeding fuses before you start, and then you'll have to go to the circuit breakers because you can't test those with a voltage drop test across the back of it. And this right here is a little thermal image I took of a fuse panel this morning. Look at this. If you've got a uh, parasitic drain, and Albert Moore, you know, came out with an article about that. I thought it was really cool. Let's say that you're, you got everything shut down, you got everything, nothing's supposed to be drawing anything. You got your interior lights, you know, disabled so that, you know, like the door latch is closed so they'll be off and you won't be confusing yourself that way. You've done all your homework, you've done it all right. You take your thermal imaging camera, and we got one of these here, and you shoot the fuse panel. And you see the hot places on this fuse panel where the current's flowing? Sometimes you can shoot that fuse panel under the dash or the one under the hood, and you'll find that parasitic drain because of the hot place on the panel. That makes sense? Where you got heat, you got resistance. All right. All right. I, I, I took a picture of that fuse panel this morning. See that fuse right there? You can't just look at it. A lot of times you won't even be able to fill it with your hand if you feel of it, but this thing right here will pick it up because it automatically rescales itself. Um, and, uh, all right. Now, here's the last one here. Uh, we're almost done. A vehicle comes in with a complaint that the instrument lamps illuminate when the brake pedal is depressed. When I mash the brakes, if it happens to be late in the evening or maybe early in the evening when I first mash the brakes, I see, and I haven't even turned on my lights yet, I see my dash lights come on when I mash the brakes. Ignition A says the wiring under the dash near the brake lamp switch is likely to be shorted. That sound right? Huh? Technician B says a bad stopper tail light bulb is probably the cause. Well, if it was shorter, would that just make it go out? No, I mean, if it depends on what you're going to short, you're talking about. If you've got a power, if you got one power lead shorted to another one, it's supposed to be out only a certain time, then both of them are going to wake up. Because anything you power up is going to light up the whole, everything it touches. What's a, what's a what's a what's a what's the smartest thing you can do first? I've actually seen guys come over there to me. They were beating their heads against the wall when I was working over there in the dealership, and say, they say this happened. I used to see this all the time. They say when I managed to break the dash lights, come on, I don't know what to do. No. Check the no, because obviously mashing the brake makes them come on. You're not going to find anything that way. I told them to take all the bulbs out of the back and see if it still does it. <laughs> and when they did, it didn't do it anymore. Pause. You'll see it. See that? Yeah. Pause. That's what those bulbs are made like on here. Now these, you might laugh at these bulbs because you're thinking, oh, I've got them other kind of bulbs in them now. This right here. These bulbs are still on some of the really late model cars, believe it or not. These go with a brass bottom. Now this is what they look like on the inside. I drew this on paint. That right there is up the ground, that's grounded. This right here provides the ground to both of those. This is what's going wrong. See that? Internally shorted. That little wire there is touching that one. Because heating and getting colder and all, we got over there next to it. And now what happens is whenever you hit your stoplights, it back feeds through here and goes back up front. And you can't tell it, but it's also lining up the tail lights. And the tail lights are also wired in there with the dash lights. Now the front part lights won't usually come on. But anyway, what the customer notices is the dash lights come on. Now you know the dash lights are actually wired coming off of the tail lights. So if the tail light fuse blows, the dash lights will go out too. So that you'll know you got a problem. 
they're wired up that way on purpose a lot of times. Uh, but anyway, uh, so make notes on that. Uh, yeah, that little picture right there tells the whole tale. You know, people will say, how the heck did a bulb cause this? Well, I just wanted to make sure you guys were a little smarter than the average bear. <laughs> <laughs>